How can you get rich with hacking? Report a security issue to a bug bounty program, get the money and then repeat that. But is it really that easy? Well, the problem is you have to find vulnerabilities. You cannot report the same issue over and over and get money, right? Right? In this video, I want to talk about a few unfixable bugs or unfixable issues and how you can maybe use them to generate an endless stream of money. Have a look at this bug bounty report. Possible denial of service when entering a long password. And the issue is quite simple. Go to the sign up page, enter a long password and this may lead to the website becoming unavailable or unresponsive. The argument here is that hashing a large amount of data will take a lot of server resources. Result is a denial of service. So of course you get a hundred dollar bounty and even a CVE for it. Luckily for us, Nextcloud is open source, so we can see the actual fix. In the passwordcontroller.php, they now check the maximum length of the password to be 100. But I'm a little bit suspicious here. In the Nextcloud documentation about password hashing, we can see that it uses Argon2, but you can also configure it to use PHP's password default. This tells me that it simply uses PHP's password hash function. See here, there are options, password default, Default, password bcrypt or as the documentation indicated password argon 2i. Now fun fact if you use the default bcrypt which is also not too bad then the password parameter is being truncated of 72 bytes. So with that configuration there wouldn't be an issue but is it maybe an issue for argon? Well let's throw up a quick experiment. Here's a loop, we generate some random passwords with increasing length i and then we measure the time before and after the hashing to see how long it took. That's an indication for how many resources it's eating up. And we can see now that it always takes roughly 0.3 seconds. But the report was talking about 10,000 character long passwords. But we are slowly getting there. Hmm, still 0.31 seconds. Let's wait a little bit longer. Ooh, we start to see a few 0.32 seconds, but we are now also in the millions, so like a megabyte long password, but now we finally see the time increasing more. But PHP fatal error. This didn't crash because of the hash. We generated a way too long password string here. The last one was 51 million characters long. Long story short, I don't believe password hashing process will result in CPU and memory exhaustion. So as this comment by Kotori on Twitter said it nicely in response to my question, I guess you will most probably hit a maximum upload size limit first. But who cares if we get a bounty and a CVE, keep reporting it. Here is Nextcloud again, just a different endpoint, this time in the lost controller, so forget password functionality. No bounty paid yet, but it should get one and this also got a CVE again. Another report from Imager, the service might not be able to handle such lengthy passwords coming from different machines simultaneously and you get a $250 bounty for that. So is this vulnerability an infinite money glitch? Just keep reporting this, claim that it's an issue and get a bounty and CVEs? Luckily submitting this is not always successful. GitLab for example pushed back against the reporter who kept insisting that this is a vulnerability, referencing another report that were deemed valid. But in the end, not only was the report false, but GitLab already had password length restrictions. So are all these reports fake? No, I have to admit, the issue is not always blatantly false. For example, in the web framework Django in 2013, there maybe was a valid issue. Django implemented pbkdf2 themselves and so I took this code and cooked up another experiment. So we again, we generate increasingly longer passwords and hash them with this function and as you can see, it does take significantly more and more time. The security advisory stated, a password one megabyte in size, for example, will require roughly one minute of computation. In 2023, this is not true anymore. A password of one megabyte on my laptop is under 10 seconds, but still it scales. Send 20 megabytes and you are probably at the one minute mark. But I have more to complain about here. You see, okay, the code might hang the process for a while, but the attacker also has to send megabytes of data. You cannot send this very fast. And so this DOS attack takes up time and takes up resources on the attacker side as well which leaves us with a big question. 
at what resource ratio a denial of service becomes an issue or not. It's clear that an extreme example like a single request killing the complete server forever, that is bad. But there's a lot in between. Where do we draw the line? Is sending megabytes of data not already, you know, asking a lot from the attacker? That's debatable and that leads us to the next argument. The impact of a denial of service and generally resource exhaustion also depends on how the web application is deployed. Actually, most server setups have timeouts. For example, in PHP, there is max execution time of 30 seconds and Nginx has, I believe, 60 seconds by default. Which means even if the password would theoretically take 10 minutes to compute, the server already kills the process after 30 seconds. Now we can argue over these default numbers. Maybe 30 seconds is too long, but there's a reason why it's set to these numbers. Apparently we kinda accept that some requests might take this long. But okay, maybe we say this is an issue. A couple of these hanging requests could really take down the server and we are not able to answer regular users anymore. But on more modern serverless deployments, maybe they automatically just keep spinning up virtual machines and handle more users. And that probably solves the availability issue. At a cost though, maybe these VMs become expensive. But now you ask yourself, is it more expensive to spin up a few machines when the attacker doesn't even know how much it will cost the business versus spending hundreds of dollars on bounties and the hourly rate of an engineer triaging the report, writing security advisories and then implementing the fixes? So if the argument for these denial of service issues becomes that a denial of service is costing the business, for example, lost revenue, then you have to balance that with the cost of the supposed fixes. Generally, we would say a fix is always better because then it's fixed, problem solved for eternity, right? But what if I told you, you cannot fix these issue? That's basically the gist of this whole video. These are unfixable bugs. It's a game of whack-a-mole. I will prove it to you. For example, here's another Nextcloud report about denial of service by requesting reset password. The person apparently sent over 1000 requests to the password reset endpoint, which made the server not responsive for over one hour. Sounds really bad. So the reporter got $250 bug bounty reward and a CVE on top of it. This sounds weird. So I looked into the source code of the fix to learn about what the original code did. Nextcloud implements a brute force middleware which performs the brute force protection. And if an endpoint is marked with brute force protection, then the throttler sleep delay function was called. The fix of this issue is now changing this to calling sleep delay or throw on max instead. But let's think about the original code first. Do you get a sense where this is going? Well, sleep delay calls get delay with the user's IP. So if one IP keeps sending more and more requests, the delay will increase. The server process literally sleeps for many seconds. No clue how large the delay can grow, but that could easily go up two minutes, maybe an hour. This code was added in 2016 for security to implement brute force protection. And now a hunter, four years later in 2020, tries to brute force the password reset endpoint. Does it click? Because the attacker sends a request from the same IP, these requests start to sleep. And now think about what the hunter wrote here. The server was not responsive for over one hour. They triggered the sleep with their own IP and couldn't reach Nextcloud anymore. So was this bug bounty report completely bullshit? Well, actually probably it was a real denial of service because request throttling when implemented like this is inherently flawed. If an attacker attempts to brute force, the server will sleep and a regular request by the user can still be handled. But if the attacker does too many brute force attempts, then maybe too many backend instances sleep and regular users cannot be responded to anymore. That's a DOS. But it is also a fix against brute force. You cannot brute force because the server is sleeping. But the server is sleeping, so now you have a DOS issue. And so let's have a look at the fix of this bug report. We see the code was changed from sleep delay to sleep delay or throw on max. The code now gets a max amount of allowed requests for the IP. And if that is reached, it doesn't sleep anymore, but immediately throws a 429 too many requests error. So, okay, the report was valid and the issue is fixed. Well, in my opinion, not really, because there is no real fix. It always is a game of whack-a-mole. It's unfixable. So you should listen now because now you get a chance to submit the issue again and get a bounty and a CVE. For that, let's start again at the beginning. 
It all started apparently with a brute force issue on the login. There were no brute force protections against brute forcing, so they implemented request throttling. This however caused a denial of service due to it being implemented with sleep. We get another report and now we limit how much the throttling can sleep and also how many requests per IP can trigger it. So the solution to the issue seems to be IP rate limiting. But is that the answer to everything? It seems so when you look around at reports. $100 for login brute force fixed with IP rate limits. Here a report without a reward but still valid and the fix implements rate limiting with IP addresses. But the problem is. IP rate limiting can always be bypassed with more IPs. There are attackers out there that can just send lots of requests through Tor, use public proxies, use VPNs, or an evil attacker might simply have a botnet. There are so many ways you can bypass this, which means you could still cause a denial of service or even perform the original brute force issue. Here for example a Twitter bug report getting $420 for bypassing the IP rate limiting by using different IPs. And remember the weblate fix from before where they fixed brute forcing with IP rate limiting? The fix is from the 27th of April. Literally on the day of that fix, another user, shame upon him who thinks evil upon it, reports that you can bypass this with more servers or more IPs. So you should actually implement rate limits per user account. So yeah, you heard it here. I think we can now report a DOS issue to Nextcloud, arguing that you can simply use more IPs. But I refuse to report that. I think that's dirty game. Because honestly, how would they even fix that issue? Okay, well, request throttling with sleeps is inherently flawed due to the denial of service. So yeah, that's maybe a valid report, I guess. But the reason they implement it like this is for anti-brute forcing. If you remove the throttling, then you allow brute forcing again. Prevent the brute forcing with IP rate limits again? Well, if an attacker really wants, they can always get more IPs and bypass this. So the painful reality is maybe, yes, request throttling with sleep is maybe causing the whole server to become unavailable, but at least that definitely protects against brute force. Server down, no brute force. And depending on the threat model, maybe that's exactly what you want. But okay, maybe we implement other ways of rate limiting then. We talked about brute force, right? Maybe we can make sure somebody cannot brute force the password of a user. IP rate limiting is not perfect. Maybe we just rate limit logins per user. Instacart appears to do exactly that. Here's a report that on mobile the user didn't get locked out, but the fix was to lock the account. And the user then gets an email to unlock the account again. Is this maybe finally the end of the cycle? Are we breaking out? Circle. Did we finally reach the correct fix Be to this issue? Well, if we look into OVAS about blocking brute force attempts, specifically combating it with account lockouts, they write here, an attacker can cause a denial of service by locking out large amount of accounts. An attacker can cause a diversion by locking out many accounts and flooding the help desk with support calls. And so now we come into the realm of threat modeling and different users and different use cases have different requirements. Maybe you prefer your Nextcloud server to be locked up when being attacked to stop any brute force attempts, while somebody else doesn't care about the brute force because they use secure passwords and rather have the server just to not just throttle everything. It's just unfixable. There are always arguments and edge cases and different requirements and threat models. But this is still not the end of it. The problems just keep coming. From the Instacart report, for example, we know that they sent out an email for users to unlock their account if they got locked out due to the brute force attempt. So we could now abuse that and trigger sending lots and lots of emails. Sending emails could cost money. Or even worse, it could result in the email being marked as spam by some systems due to the flood of them, which could really negatively impact the business, essentially blocking many legitimate users from receiving important emails, for example, when they try to sign up or if they try to purchase something. And suddenly we realize we are right back at the beginning, back at triggering some kind of denial of service against the system. And now we try to fix that. Request throttling, IP rate limiting, take whatever poison you want and once the drugs hit your brain you realize that it's even worse than you imagined. We just talked about issues surrounding logins but those are not the only endpoints that exist. Every website, especially a lot more complex websites, probably have some HTTP API that is 
expensive to execute. Maybe an image upload, upload gigabytes of data without rate limits, filling up their cloud storage and triggering massive costs. Also, many services generate thumbnails or crop images on uploads. That's computing resources. Maybe not much, but without rate limiting on those endpoints, maybe a little bit larger images still cause resource exhaustion. Any kind of a data import functionality usually is vulnerable to denial of service attempts. That's just computationally very expensive. Or maybe it's even expecting a zip file and you can throw in a zip bomb. You didn't find a site with such features? How about submitting a very long comment with 50,000 characters on GitLab? Apparently that triggered some processing on the server resulting in a thousand dollar bounties and a CVE. I can almost guarantee you, you can find DOS issues basically anywhere and everywhere. And they go hand in hand with lack of rate limiting and no brute force protection. Because there simply does not exist a clear fix. You cannot really fix these issues. In my personal made up intuitive definition of what is a vulnerability, a vulnerability has to have some kind of clear fix. SQL injection, fix the SQL injection. CSRF, add a CSRF token. And this is not the case for most of these DOS or rate limiting issues. Small footnote here, of course, there are also DOS issues like complete server crashes that don't recover or a six digit verification code, which can easily be brute forced. But then the solution usually is not rate limiting, but math. The code has to be longer or include letters to become probabilistically impossible to guess. But my point is that there exist many of these DOS and rate limiting issues that are just unfixable. You can always argue and find edge cases where it becomes weak again. And this is worst, especially for self-hosted services like Nextcloud. Everybody has a different threat model. If you deploy that on a shared Raspberry Pi 1, if it even runs on there, then of course a DOS is much easier and it might happen with five regular HTTP requests. But when it's deployed on a large server, maybe with sensible request timeouts and being able to dynamically spin up more nodes, even the most expensive request is handled like pff, whatever. Okay, enough. I hope I made it clear why I think for these issues there's no real one fix to fix it all. It always comes down to very unique situations and threat models. And if you look around in the cybersecurity industry, DOS is not the only issue of this kind. There are many more. For example, insecure browser password storage because somebody wrote a script or malware to steal the passwords. It looks bad on first sight, I get that, but when you spend one minute to think about it, you should realize it makes no sense. Of course, malware can access the password. Even when a company like Kaspersky aggressively markets their own password manager to be so much more secure than the browser password stores, it's trivial to write a malware to steal the passwords out of a password manager once it's unlocked as well. The threat model is not that different. Another good example is software obfuscation and anti-reversing. The game industry has tried for decades to solve the problem of piracy and yet every game still gets cracked. And now we have smartphones and developers desperately want obfuscation and prevent reverse engineering of their apps. But with enough dedication and efforts, it can always be reverse engineered. It's a game of whack-a-mole. It's an endless cycle. An endless cycle of money. Maybe you have heard this from security people before. If we do our job right, we are not needed anymore. That is true. If we could solve and fix all the security issues, then there are no security issues left. Our profession is not needed anymore. The problem is though, companies and maybe we security consultants and bug hunters as well, we slip into those cracks. Companies selling Android obfuscation services, security scanners reporting on CVEs and Node.js libraries that have zero impact on the actual web application, password managers fear mongering against stored password in the browser, while suffering basically from the same threat model, malware. Security consultants reporting account enumeration on login forms while you will always find some endpoint that leaks whether a user exists or not. Or you know what? Recently, credential stuffing. If hacking with real vulnerabilities becomes too hard that even black hats cannot compromise databases anymore and they just reuse credentials and scrape the data from these accounts and then we call that a data leak, Think about this, when security headlines are made without even real security issues being exploited, I think that's the best example that security is actually getting better. And so cynically speaking, maybe we have to make up some security issues to keep our job. And so recently I thought about the term cybersecurity and hacking, and I came to this conclusion that cybersecurity describes the whole package. Of course, a denial of service is bad for a business. With this video, I was not trying to say a DOS issue is not an issue. It is an issue, but 
I did want to explain why for me these issues are boring. They are not satisfying because they are unfixable. For high reliability and critical infrastructure, it is an important topic. But you know who deals with that? Not security researchers, site reliability engineers and sysadmin. These jobs defend against denial of service. For example, by implementing fail-safe processes, technical solutions to be notified when something goes down, being able to on the fly divert malicious traffic, have backup instances ready to go. This is much more active work. It's not as simple as we hackers like to think. It requires dedicated staff and ongoing monitoring. You solve the denial of service and availability issues when they happen. And so I think for most businesses, it's nothing you need to worry about too much. Honestly, ignore it and deal with it when it becomes an issue. When you actually have somebody attacking you, then you can start the whack-a-mole game with the attacker. But I don't think you need to start the whack-a-mole game with the bug hunters already. So when I mean ignore the issue, I don't mean you not care about the issue. You have to care about the issue. It's basically blue team work. You need to implement internal processes to deal when it happens. I'm just saying there doesn't exist a magical fix that you can figure out through a bug bounty report. And so, yeah, I just realized for myself, this kind of work is not that interesting to me. I think vulnerabilities and bugs that can actually be fixed, they are a lot more interesting. And then our work also has direct impact because fixed bugs are fixed and that is satisfying. Or actually more often it's sad. Spend so many hours on discovery and exploitation of a vulnerability and then this one line fixes it, taking it all away. Poof. But that's exactly the game I enjoy. Anyway, this was a little bit a rant about the cybersecurity industry. I really didn't want to offend or attack anybody with this. If anything, it's just an opening statement for a debate. Feel free to start arguing with me in the comments. Also, huge thanks to all the bug hunters with public reports. I really, really appreciate that. And just to make it clear, don't feel bad about reporting issues like that. I report these kind of issues sometimes as well. It always depends on the threat model. And in the end, it's simply what the customer demands. But I do think it's an interesting topic to think about. All right. Thanks so much for watching. If you are interested in more web security, check out our online training platform, hextree.io. You can sign up to the waiting list while we are working on creating more courses. And if you want to support Live Overflow directly, check out the YouTube membership or buy my shitty handwritten font over at shop.liveoverflow.com.